Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. It's 11.30 in Moscow. We are about to begin our uh, today's session. Welcome to the session and I will talk in English. So the language of the session will be English. Please uh, take uh, the earphones. It's easy to understand from the name of our session, which is an international company in Russia, CEO's view, that our guest speakers today are CEOs of uh, major international companies. Uh, Antonio Linares next to me, Roca, uh, Jürgen Koenig, uh, Merck, Albert Grigarian, Angie, uh, Cesare Bijogera, uh, Prismian Group, and the last and not least, Johann van der Plaats, uh, Schneider Electric. Uh, I'm presenting you, gentlemen, very poorly, since uh, shortly I shall give uh, all of you the floor to present yourselves and your companies, and for sure you will do it much more proficiently than myself. Uh, me, I am, uh, my name is Olga Bansekin, and I am chief representative for Coleman Services in Russia. I'm not going to talk a lot, uh, but while preparing to our panel, uh, I have decided to start with uh, a short parable. Uh, and this parable is uh, in order to somehow shape the mood of our discussion. I hope so, at least. So now you may, while I'm telling the parable, you may open the envelopes which I have given to you and prohibited to open before. So you may open them, and uh, if you like what is written in it, in it, you have a badge in there. Uh, if you like it, and if you feel so, you may put it on. If not, you may put it aside. So the story is the gardener's badge story. Once upon a time, uh, there was a gardener, uh, a landscape gardener, who uh, owned a business which wore, was with the family for several generations. The staff were happy, the business went well, the customers loved to visit this store uh, or to have the staff working in their gardens or to get the deliveries from this store. Uh, for as long as uh, anyone could remember, the current owner and the previous generations of owners were extremely positive and happy people. Most folk assumed it was because they owned a very successful business. But in reality, it was another way around. A tradition in the business was that the owner always wore a big label badge saying business is great. The business was indeed generally great, although it for sure came through different crises uh, and tough times like any other business. What never changed, though, was the owner's attitude and the badge. The business is great. Everyone who saw the badge for the first time uh, invariably asked, what's so great about your business? And often people started complaining about their lives and about their businesses, saying that those were miserable and themselves were miserable and, and stressed. But anyhow, the business is great badge uh, always tended to start a conversation which typically ended in um, the owner talking about lots of positive things in the business, like uh, the fascination of work itself, uh, the fun of a relaxed and healthy work environment, uh, the joy of meeting and different people each day and talking to them, uh, the reward that comes from uh, helping others, uh, the great feeling when you finish a job and uh, uh, do it to the very best of your capabilities, and so on. The list went on and on. And no matter how miserable a person was, they would usually end up feeling a lot happier after those couple of minutes uh, listening to all this infectious enthusiasm uh, and positivity. And if asked about the badge in a quiet moment, uh, the business owner would confide, the badge came first, the great business followed. I presume that doing business in Russia, specifically in these uh, days we are in, when uh, uncertainty and doubt prevail, uh, is based on positive thinking and the enthusiasm of people like you gentlemen. 
Basing on your personal experience, uh, I am sure you know that, uh, uh, at least nowadays, uh, there are not so many bears in the streets of uh, Russian big cities, at least, anymore. But lots of uh, peculiarities in Russia, which you have to first know, then to adapt, and also overcome. Still, in the course of our discussion, I would prefer we keep this uh, positive mood, at least try to. Like, business is great. Uh, and we will discuss real issues uh, and prospects of your businesses, but still, business is great. That's my opinion. I hope you share it. Uh, first, I would uh, like to mention that I'm a tough moderator. I think you know it well, but still. Uh, I'm sorry if I will need to interrupt you. We have um, uh, certain time frames. Uh, you will have to follow my rules, and those are, I will ask you a couple of questions in the beginning, and each of you will answer. Uh, then we'll have several questions which you have already seen before, uh, and I shall ask them in turn, one or another of you, of you or, or a couple of you. And then we will have uh, individual questions for each of you which you have uh, never seen before. Those might be a bit tougher than you can imagine, uh, but still. Uh, and I hope in the, that in the end I reserve some time for um, uh, some questions from the audience, if, if uh, the audience wants to ask. I hope they will. So that's the rule. Now we start with the common questions, and the first is please present yourself and your company and your, uh, I mean, globally, your company in Russia and globally, uh, and your experience in Russia. Please do not forget to tell about that. How long are you here and what are you doing here? Uh, the maximum is five minutes, from three to five. Uh, I don't know, how would you? Just starting from my left, or I don't know. Antonio. Okay. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Roca Group is a worldwide leader in bathroom industry. This is construction materials uh, supply, uh, B2B, B2C. We are having production <laughs> presence in more than 40 countries around the world. And uh, we have, of course, production presence in Russia as well, with seven factories in different regions. Lenoblast, Kalushka Oblast, I see here the deputy governor. Uh, uh, we have presence as well in uh, the Chuvash Republic, and we have presence in the Moscow region. We have been investing uh, 400 million euro in the last 16 years in Russia, and we are now investing in the eighth uh, factory in Russia. It's a 50 million euro investment that will be running in 2019 and 2020. Uh, I myself came to Russia uh, 16 years ago when we started the first uh, factory in Lenoblast. Uh, we have made also acquisitions in Russia of companies that were already running in, in this business. And our business is mostly aimed uh, first to satisfy and, and sell uh, and give uh, products to the Russian market and to, to all our clients in Russia. Secondly, uh, CIS countries and countries that belong to the uh, customs union. And thirdly, and growingly, uh, to export to other European countries, uh, mostly United Kingdom, Benelux, Scandinavian countries, and uh, Czech Republic as a logistic hub for the rest of Central Europe. Uh, we have experience. The uh, business is great uh, life of uh, doing business in Russia. <coughs> I believe that business is great is not something that happens only in Russia, as Olga was saying, this is an attitude, and this is the attitude of taking it as a game, where you have the pleasure and the privilege of seeing the result of your gaming every day, and of uh, feeling how this playing the game helps others to develop, to grow, and to feel the satisfaction of your successes. Uh, of course, it is business, and there are difficult moments as well, otherwise it would be called hobby, and it would not be a business anymore. I think I'm in the three minutes, so... <laughs> Even less. Great, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Jürgen König is my name. Uh, I'm German-Brazilian. I had the chance to work in Brazil, Germany, Pakistan, South Korea, and now five and a half years here in Russia. Uh, Merck is the oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company worldwide. 
was founded in 1668. This means this year we are celebrating our 350th anniversary. Merck went to a huge transformation during the last 10 years. Uh, we have now three businesses, uh, healthcare, life science, and performance materials. All the three businesses are represented here in Russia. We are in Russia now 120 years, but uh, five years ago, we decided to implement a new strategy here in Russia in line with what was required on the point of uh, localization. So we have uh, localized production of our healthcare products uh, here in Russia. <coughs> we have also, uh, we opened a, a life science lab at Metropolis for our customers. It's not a showroom, it's where we perform together with our customers experiments and uh, research. And uh, we have also a warehouse here in Moscow. Our major challenge, I will say, here is to implement this strategy and to be successful in the implementation. Great. You are both even quicker than I could have imagined. <laughs> Albert. So, with your permission, I will talk in English. Please follow the translation into English. Uh, to be brief, I am Albert Grigorian. I was born in Armenia. When I, I was born at the time of what used to be the Soviet Union, and I spent 20 years in the Soviet Union. And as part of that, I can feel Russia really well because we were all in the Soviet Union. But from 1997, I live in France, and most of half of my conscious life, I live in France, and I feel very comfortable here and there. And I came here from Paris in 20, um, 13. Uh, so I live in Moscow uh, for more than six years. I represent uh, my company here and in Ukraine. And I am honored to be a representative of uh, such a prominent power industry company. So, as my colleagues said, so we are not novice people in Russia, so we are present in Russia for a long period of time. Uh, so, last year we celebrated 125 years of presence in Russia, so we worked here before the revolution. So, those who live in St. Petersburg, they know that we have the power. Uh, uh, the power station number three, which was built uh, uh, back uh, in 1908. At that time, it was called uh, Société Générale. And the structure that uh, built the power plant was uh, one of the predecessors of our company. Uh, so, which was established back in 1922. Uh, so, shortly we will be celebrating uh, 200 years anniversary. So, our headcount is uh, 150,000 people. So, last year our turnover was uh, 60 billion euros. So, we are present in 70 countries. So, we have uh, the main uh, business area like gas, uh, electric power and services. And uh, we have uh, 103 gigawatts uh, of production power worldwide, mm, while the total Russian rate is 240, like uh, 250 gigawatts in Russia, and 23% of them are renewable sources of power. So we are really focused on the future. That's important for us. That's all. Uh, now, uh, uh, my name is Cesare B. Gioger. I'm in Russia since uh, almost uh, 10 years, and uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Prismian. Prismian is a multinational company, it's the leader in 
cable business, both for telecommunication and energy. We have a turno um, global turnover of 11 billion euro, developing in 50 countries uh, with 112 factory and 30,000 people. This is a multinational uh, headquarter based in Italy. That's why I'm Italian. And uh, we are located in Russia with a localization, means with a production uh, since 10 years. But we started working in this uh, country more than 30 years ago. And we were one of the pioneers in doing uh, the first uh, high voltage cable installation in, in this country. Our factory in, uh, in Russia is, uh, is not big if you compare with the turnover of uh, the, let me say, the energy environment. Uh, we do less than 100 million euro, but we are very focalized in some high technology product that we transfer in, uh, in Russia almost 10 years ago with uh, an acquisition of a small company and further refurbishment. What to say about the business? Uh, for sure, business is, uh, is great. Uh, it's great, why? Because uh, we are a business addicted. Without business, we, we cannot live, uh, unluckily, maybe sometime. And uh, if you like challenges, business is even better in Russia, because challenges here are very peculiar sometimes. Thank you. Johan. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Olga. Johan van der Plaats. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, born in Belgium, but I actually already uh, work and live in, in, in Russia for uh, 25 years, which is scary. If I look in the room, some of you were probably not even born yet when I was already working and living here. Uh, and during that uh, period, I've been um, uh, working actually for three uh, global international companies. Uh, for 10 years, I managed the business of uh, uh, Alcatel, which was telecommunication. Uh, then uh, seven years, I was uh, managing the business of uh, Emerson, which is uh, process automation. And now, since three years, I'm in charge of uh, the business of uh, Schneider Electric, uh, which is uh, uh, a company uh, which is um, uh, focused on uh, distribution, automation, management of, of energy, uh, electricity, low voltage, uh, medium voltage, uh, also data center and, and, and automation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, during those 25 years, I think uh, just the fun part is that uh, uh, before my eyes, I have seen a complete transformation of uh, uh, of, uh, of the country. Uh, remember very well the early 90s, incomparable to, uh, to the Russia of, uh, of today. Uh, during those 25 years, uh, uh, moments of, uh, of ups and downs. Um, I remember vividly the default of 98, when many foreign companies said, that is it, we will leave the market, and those who stayed uh, uh, won the market. A um, uh, similar kind of tough period was in 2008. Um, same kind of a story, financial crisis uh, mainly, driven by a drop of oil and price. Um, and now again, we are indeed, uh, Olga, in a, um, a challenging times, but I would actually argue, and I can then afterwards, if you want, uh, comment more in detail about that, that uh, out of the, the three difficult periods that I, that I experienced, this one is the toughest, by far, uh, for, uh, for, for, many, uh, for many reasons. Uh, last word on Schneider Electric, uh, yeah, in Russia we employ 10,000 people. Uh, we have five factories. Uh, we do believe in uh, uh, localization as well as my, my colleagues are, are, are mentioning. Um, and uh, bon, with the ups and downs, uh, I think uh, um, we still look with confidence to the future. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, do not switch off uh, the mic, Johan. I just wanted to start another way around. I am waiting for a definition from each of you, just one word. A noun, it may be a noun, a verb, or an adjective of uh, which would describe the situation for your company in Russia for the moment? Or possibly your business sector, not your company, but uh, anyway. Look, I think, um, uh, let, me, let me use the word challenging. I know that typically in those kind of, of events, um, people reflect a hooray mood, we are the best, everything is rosy, uh, uh, we do the right things and we're going to conquer the market. Uh, yes, this is true. Um, but at the same time, I basically touched about that. I think uh, the period today is, uh, uh, for Russia as a whole is challenging um, globally, macroeconomically, and we're working in that macroeconomic <coughs> environment. If you look at um, the GDP of Russia in 2018, well, the statistics are deferring 
but people say it grew between 1.5, 1.7%. That is depressing. That is very, very low globally. Yeah? Uh, and then on top of that, uh, if you detract um, uh, the part of exportation of natural resources from that growth, uh, you could even argue that the country is in a recession. Uh, if you look at the global economy worldwide, um, countries are typically growing 3 4% or even higher. Uh, my belief is that Russia should have the ambition to grow quicker, because today it's an objective fact. Uh, the country is <coughs> lagging behind uh, many other economies which are growing faster. And in my view, this is caused by, uh, by uh, two, I mean, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but there are two main reasons here. Uh, there is the external challenges, which are unprecedented, but there are also the internal challenges. On the external challenges, uh, you talk about the geopolitical context. Uh, sanctions, they do have an impact on uh, the economy. It depends, the, the, the level of impact depends in the business in which you are. But we happen to be in, uh, in the energy business, and energy business is one of the businesses which is in focus uh, of, uh, of global sanctions, which basically means that, back to my word, challenging, we need to readjust the way that we go to, that, uh, to the market, and I can talk about that separately. So you're having that, uh, that uh, external uh, factor which is bigger for one sector, less for the other sectors. Agriculture, by the way, is doing well, very well, I would even argue. So it's a, it's a mixed story, but altogether, um, it is in a tough environment. And then, yes, indeed, there are also the internal challenges. Uh, we talk a lot about the fact that um, um, Russia is, uh, the economy is depending too much on big, huge state multinational companies which are not efficient. If I look at the example, for instance, of, of Germany, uh, yes, you do have Siemens, which is a big company which we respect, but the, the strength of the German economy is the thousands of uh, small and medium enterprises which are very dynamic, which are really uh, developing quickly. And, and here, unfortunately, we have this structural problem. Uh, uh, there is not, not enough support, in my view, for, uh, for, uh, for SMEs. Uh, we talk about um, uh, the legal framework. We talk about, indeed, um, uh, administrative challenges that you have. Uh, I can name them. They're all well known, uh, but I wished that, uh, that also the internal, irrespective of the external challenges, but that, that the country would also focus on, on tackling more seriously the internal uh, challenges so that the country as a whole can reach the growth that it should achieve. It should definitely be 3 4 5% uh, um, uh, on a yearly basis, and then we would all be better off. Yes, I totally agree about the fact that this country should be in a growth path different than what is now. But uh, in one word, I would say that in this period, we are facing a small recovery. That's a good sign, in my opinion. And luckily, the recovery is too slow. It's too slow to fulfill the level of investment that is supposed to be necessary for the potential of this country. Uh, that's why, in my opinion, we need uh, to understand uh, which type uh, of stability, stability of growth, that is sometimes a contradiction, but at the end, uh, we want to have a stable growth at the level that justify the investment uh, that we claim to have in Russia. Thank you, Cesare. Albert. I would uh, use uh, just one word uh, for our business, stability and continuity. And I'll tell you uh, one uh, short story. We started buying Russian gas in 1975 when it was uh, felt in Europe that diversification is needed. Uh, because uh, there was not enough di diversification of the sources of energy. And after that, European countries started looking at different possible sources. Uh, uh, tough times uh, um, were um, um, there. Um, there were some sanctions from the U.S., but despite that, our company managed to sign a purchase agreement with Gazprom, Soyuz Gazprom Escrow was, was that was the name of the company then. It was 1975, and since then every year we continue prolonging this agreement. We buy a lot of gas from Gazprom. So our business 
uh, that's uh, continuity. This is the most important word for us. We never had uh, some major bombshells and we didn't have any problems with Gazprom. We think that this is a great partner for us. We are also an important partner for Gazprom. We are the fifth uh, client for them by uh, the volume of gas we purchase. And for us, Gazprom is the second largest uh, partner. I can also add something if I still have time. The turnover uh, that uh, is related to Gazprom trade, it's one seventh of the total turnover between Russia and France. So this is really a very significant uh, turnover. And we think that we can continue doing business with Russia. Um, NG participates in the Northern Stream One. We are financial partners for this project, and we are going to put, uh, we are participating in the Northern Stream Two as well. Uh, but there is a second undertone, I would say. So we can participate in major projects. That's one part of the story. But if you are present in Russia, if you have business in Russia, that's a different story. But we'll talk about that later on. Thank you, Jürgen. So That's true. answer with two. <laughs> uh, the first, I agree with uh, the colleague Johan. Uh, uh, yes, it's a challenge, uh, but uh, I call it a positive challenge. When we use the word challenge, we can say it's a challenge, or you can say it's a challenge. <laughs> and uh, we at Merck, we see Russia as a challenge. This is the first. The second word which I need to use here is the word opportunity. Uh, we see a huge opportunity. If you see for our market in healthcare life science performance materials, uh, we have 140 million inhabitants in Russia plus nearly 140 in the other CIS countries. This means it's a huge area of 280 million inhabitants. And we all know uh, what can be done uh, with 280 million. If we see in the next 20, 30 years where the major growth of population will be uh, and which areas or uh, regions will stagnate, we know very well that uh, there is a huge opportunity in Russia and the other CIS countries. Thank you. It doesn't work. Antonio. Yeah. Um, well, it it's, it's difficult after so many uh, sure. wise men uh, to say something that has not been said. I, I have to say, yeah, challenging, challenging. I, I, to, to use the word that has been already, um, since I cannot use the words that have been used by my colleagues, let me use one, one word. Uh, it, it, the word would be context. Uh, and why I want to use this word, context? Because we, we often judge uh, the situations that we know well and in deep uh, tougher than whatever happens elsewhere. Why? Because whatever we know in depth, we know in depth with all the problems and difficulties. While whatever we see from the outside, we see usually the brightest side, and there is less detail and level of, of information on the difficulties of all those other places. Therefore, when I judge what are the perspectives in Russia uh, and uh, the context and the possibilities of developing and continuing investing, I do it comparing with other places where I would else consider to uh, invest. And I cannot say that I see places where I would like to invest more than I would like to invest in Russia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and why is this so? Because difficulties uh, exist, and there are many in the world. These difficulties have a transition period and then uh, stabilize. And what we need to do as businessmen is to think where we are now and where may we be after the stabilization will happen. There is another principle in, in physics and in life that is uh, important, is the principle of indetermination of Heisenberg, if you allow me to be a bit pedant, which means that wherever you are looking at, you are already uh, somehow modifying the behavior of uh, what you are looking at. And uh, w while knowing such uh, detail of what is happening in Russia and listening so much of the difficulties, sometimes we may uh, become pessimistic. Uh, 
and we have, we have to look somewhere else and we have to get the light open in the windows and we have to get the, the, wind, the wind coming inside by opening and letting the wind come inside. In our business, construction materials, look around and, and see what is happening in regions and see the speed of construction in Moscow and the speed of construction in regions and the quality of the infrastructure in Moscow and in regions. And you will then realize that there is still a lot coming. Uh, let's look at the macroeconomic situation of Russia and the, and the fun foundations of the, of the macroeconomic situation of Russia. So there is ground uh, stronger than in other places that have better uh, advertisement and press. So in, in my view, Russia has still a long uh, way to go and we have to judge within the context. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Cesare, the question goes to you. Uh, which are the main objectives or targets uh, which are in front of your company in Russia for the next five, ten years. And uh, another question here is, uh, has the time frame changed uh, during this difficult period of time? I mean, the time frame of uh, forecasting for the company. Yes, I start answering from the uh, second question. Yes, the time frame changed. That's why I will not like to answer in the next five, ten years, but in the next three years. Okay. Uh, and luckily, we have to plan in the short term uh, because uh, our company wants to have payback of everything, of every euro or rubble or whatsoever you invest. That's why in the next uh, three years, what we are targeting is to at least saturate the existing asset. Uh, for sure, we further invest uh, in, uh, in some uh, upgrading of product range, upgrading of, uh, you know, the market approach, uh, and so on. But the most important uh, um, target in the next three years is to saturate this. Why I'm telling this? Because, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we came uh, in Russia to invest, uh, not only Prismian, but many multinational, with a market perspective larger than what we have today. Uh, this is preventing a bit uh, the speed of investing, but not uh, the aim. Means that we still have in our plan, uh, in our long term, medium term plan, a larger uh, level of investment. But unluckily, the speed is. Uh, changed a bit uh, after the recent crisis driven by sanction, but not only by sanction. Um, what is different uh, now, and this is what we claim, is uh, the reliability of uh, the state investment. I remember some years ago, for example, that in October, November of the, of the, of the year, you have the announcement uh, of the investment in infrastructure and in, in energy infrastructure, electrical infrastructure. And 70% of what w has been announced materialized normally in the following year. Now the situation is totally different. You don't have any more budget announced in advance. And uh, you have step by step uh, uh, investment done uh, by the authorities. This is bad. Why is bad? Because uh, our business uh, is driven by efficiency. Efficiency in a plant uh, is driven by the volume. And the volume needs to be well planned. If you don't plan the volume in the proper way, you cannot be effective. And if you are not effective, you are not profitable, and then the payback, as I, that I mentioned before, change. And then the company has, are not so keen to move money in the market. Despite that, uh, for sure, I follow what the colleagues said, uh, the market has a huge perspective. If we think about the infrastructure in energy, but not only, also in telecommunication, that we need is huge. We speak about uh, a smart city, smart grid, and so on, but everything is driven by data, by information. And here, if we think about the fiber network in Russia, need to be strongly developed. We are involved in fiber production, in telecommunication cables. That's why this is, can be a next step target for us in terms of investment. We are thinking about this, but unluckily today we don't see the same, let me say, market reliability that we had 10 years ago when we start our investment in energy. 
Thank you, Cesare. Johan, next question is yours. Uh, I would like to ask you what are your expectations as an investor from or your demands towards the Russian uh, government, Russian authorities for the moment, today? Uh, the main of them, of course. Yeah, but demands is a very big word, right? I know. <laughs> I've, uh, I, what I what I uh, what I think is um, an expectation. I would then phrase it upon, and it's touching a little bit what I just uh, heard as well. Is uh, uh, do not save money on investing in education. Uh, why is that? Because I think we are in front of a um, um, a digital transformation, which is indeed unprecedented. You call it Industry 4.0. You talk. Uh, about Internet of Things, you talk about the complete transformation on the way that we are living, working, um, uh, which is a kind of a technology that Schneider Electric is, is promoting. Uh, but in order to, uh, and this, uh, by the way, there is a, a race going on globally in the world between different uh, economies and countries about introducing and moving to that new Industry 4.0. The big bottleneck uh, that, uh, that um, uh, business is having is um, qualified people, engineering, trained people, re uh, retrained people. Um, so uh, if indeed you have a, uh, a global budget uh, to spend, um, it's fantastic that, uh, that we are having the, the new generation Vanguard uh, missile nowadays uh, uh, on the market. But I would really argue uh, uh, invest in education, because if you don't do that, you are losing the future. A yeah, very important issue, actually. I am in the HR field, so I know how tough is that. <laughs> we cannot uh, talk about it a lot, but still, it's it's extremely important for sure. Thank you, Johan. Uh, my next question goes to Albert, to you. Uh, Last year, in uh, 2018, Russia has reached the 31st position in uh, the rating doing business and has improved its position by four points and is now in between uh, Spain and France. Could you please comment on the issue? Can you see any real improvement in, in doing business in Russia? Is it applicable, the, the rating itself, I mean, to the reality? I was asking Alberta, actually, but if you, if you wish, you may, you may answer. Okay. I can answer that. As for rating doing business, I have some real uh, time experience. We have Gazprom as partners, and I would say that they are amazing partners. We do not have any bottlenecks. We understand each other perfectly. Uh, Gazprom people are highly qualified. They are wonderful professionals. So here I commend them. As for the business environment in Russia, that's a different story. I do have some practical experience of doing business in Russia, and my view is the following. We'd like to have more protection for investors. And it's not related to Russian uh, or foreign investors. I'm just talking about investors in general. We think that we need to be confident that if we have some problems, we'll find solutions through the judicial system, through the arbitrage, arbitration court. But we do not have uh, such a confidence. Of course, we can uh, tell you more about that if you are interested. Yeah, but I can openly say uh, right now that we have challenges with that. We want to see some improvements about that. To add something, Antonio, you will be the next if you wish. I think one of the uh, results uh, to come to the 31st position uh, is the role played by the investment zones. I think they are doing an excellent job. The young people uh, in these uh, investment zones uh, are really convincing the investors. Uh, this is one, one big point, which I think. And the second point is the role of the association and the chambers. The chambers, they all they became, I'm talking about the Russian Chamber of Commerce, I'm talking of AB, of uh, 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 the German chambers and so on. Uh, they all start to play a major role in all the process. 
and uh, defending the interests of the investors in the country. I think these two uh, groups, they have uh, played a huge role here in Russia. Uh, we have a visible uh, uh, situation. If you look this room, for example, we have a lot of young faces, as you mentioned at the beginning, and uh, basically none of them has the translator. Yes? It's a good sign that doing business in Russia is more easy than the past, because you can speak as a multinational company that unluckily we speak English. I don't like English, I prefer Italian, but unluckily in the multinational <laughs> company we speak English because we have a common language. But, and the, the Russian people now has the same you know, tool, it's a tool, to manage uh, a business. That's a good sign, in my opinion. But I would like, Antonio, I do remember about you, but I would like to say that uh, the foreigners has already, uh, has also changed during these times. I do remember when in 1998, none of the foreigners working here was speaking Russian. None. And now all of you know Russian to some of them, flu uh, some of you do speak fluently, some of, some of you know it <laughs> at the level of <laughs> understanding, but still. <laughs> That's mutual admiration. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, we, we, <coughs> we see and we've been the last 16 years investing and, and uh, having a, a relationship with many uh, Russian investors as well, with whom we entered in negotiations for, for uh, either joint investments or acquisitions. And, and uh, Johan mentioned it at the beginning. SMEs is one of the things that I believe that, uh, that if, if to, uh, I do not dare to say, to, if, if to advise uh, where uh, we should put an emphasis and where the Russian economy lacks diversification, uh, Russian economy has a strong muscle, but is, uh, is missing a certain degree of flexibility and a comprehensive solutions that help middle and small businesses to grow uh, to set up, to not fear uh, giving it to the next generation for uh, uh, continuing making it grow. And this is very important for the, for the growth of an economy. If we compare with other economies that are already very much uh, well established, the percentage of SMEs in those economies is much higher. And in this regard, uh, I would advise, uh, and, and judging from our experience, when we are, we are now making, the, as I said, uh, building the eighth factory, and still now, and being a multinational company, and having the access that we have uh, to resources that uh, smaller businesses would not be able to, to reach, we still see the difficulties, for example, in a very early stage in the investment. And the early stages in SMEs are the most critical. Because if, if they do not overcome them, then it will not exist, full stop. For a bigger company, there is strong uh, financial uh, muscle to face those initial uh, stages. And these initial stages specifically refer to gas, electricity, water, and canalization. It sounds stupid, but this is one of the biggest challenges, getting that, getting the quotas, the so-called quotas, the technical conditions, having some transparent ratios that will not make it possible for some uh, specific uh, organizations to not having the big picture take decisions that may condition that investment. This, I believe, would be important. So going more into the uh, one window that gives, or at least one transparent rate that give to different businesses different rates that are, susta that are sustainable financially. Antonio, a, con a connected question goes to you then. Uh, if comparing, say, uh, 2013 and the last year, 2018, uh, is there any difference in your, can you state a uh, difference in your communications with uh, the authorities at the local or federal level, with the government, uh, with the ministries, uh, whatever? Yeah, we, we, we are, as I said, lucky enough to have a very fluent uh, communication. As Albert was saying, we, we always have the door open whenever we have trouble. Uh, but then there are limitations that even the government and the, and the government officials uh, 
experience difficult difficulties to overcome because it is not under their responsibility. When the electricity quotas depend of a separate organization that is not under their direct supervision, uh, the possibility of, of having enough electricity to set up that business, uh, they might be interested. They might even consider that the level of employment in, the, in that region is uh, interesting. But sometimes narrow-minded uh, organizations that have only one thing into perspective may condition the development of the on the image. This still happens now and this is one of the things that I believe can improve with action. An action that is not political is mostly technical. It's just a redistribution and a reassignation of some uh, responsibilities. Thank you. Jurgen, the question goes to you. Uh, in regards to the Lush Russian law, can you name uh, the major issues, I don't like the word problems, which you have in your day-to-day -day business uh, connected to the, any, any area of the Russian law? Can you name the laws if, which uh, cause obstacles or uh, questions from I your side? I you positive examples, but uh, also uh, areas of concern. And I would like here to focus more on the areas of concern. There have been improvements the last five years that I've been here. Uh, redu reducing uh, uh, sometimes bureaucracy and so on. But uh, my major concern is uh, related to how much predictable is the frame given to the business. Uh, very often we see very uh, changing uh, done by the government and uh, without involving all parties, and here I would like to see much more the involvement, not only from the associations, but the companies in uh, expert groups, where in advance uh, people with experience can uh, help uh, and suggest uh, solutions uh, for certain topics. So my concern here is regarding legislation, that sometimes things start to run and then no one can stop and uh, it will be implemented, it's going to Duma and uh, finish. And uh, it could be done differently uh, with uh, the involvement more of uh, associations and uh, companies. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, Cesare, uh, is your company still investing for the moment? You have mentioned it a little bit, but uh, more in details, I mean, which you can give or planning to invest. And has your, the strategy of your company on the Russian market changed recently or not? Yes, as I mentioned before, we are investing with a different speed. I don't want to repeat myself. The strategy changed, yes. Uh, we came in Russia uh, with a perspective of growing not only in terms of profitability, as all the company want to do, but also in terms of dimension. Now, sorry, for the Russian market and for CIS, now we change the strategy in two directions. First of all, we are more focusing on the top part of uh, the product range, where you really need technology, when you really need to have more added value, driven by service, driven by, uh, uh, let me say, customer care and so on. First, and the second very important, uh, the Russian assets uh, are also useful for the export. Or let me say for what we call intercompany. Means that our company in the beginning uh, was doing less than 5% of the local production dedicated for, uh, um, you know, Europe, for example. Last year, we closed a year about more than 40% of our production that we exported. What does it mean? It means that uh, the asset that we have here now has, luckily, the same level of quality that is required in Europe. It's a good sign for Russia, it's a good sign for our company, first of all, but also it's a good sign for Russia. So we can find material, skill, and sometimes also a piece of technology that we can apply locally to, to export. Yes, we are investing. We are investing with a different perspective, 
using the asset not only for the local market. Thank you. Jürgen, partnering with uh, Russian companies, I know you have partners, you have mentioned that before in our private discussion. Uh, does it have any specifics compared to other countries you have big experience? I presume it does. But which major points would you state? And if you can, please describe the Russian partner of your dream, like several definitions. Well, first of all, I will go for the final question. We do have the partners of the dream. This is a statement. Yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah, we are lucky. Uh, when we decided to go for the localization, uh, I remember I have been asked why you are not coming to build one more factory. And we decided not to build one more factory for production of medicines because we found out that in Russia there is a lot of capacity available. And we saw deeply the figures. When you ask several companies what is your utilization of capacity, they will answer 70, 80, 90 percent. Maybe if they work in one shift. So if you want to be productive in the pharmaceutical area, you need to have a factory running 24-7. This is the rule for productivity. And uh, we saw that uh, it's a huge capacity, and then we started to look for local partners. Because we said, if one company more will come to Russia to build a factory, this will not help the country, because the cost of goods per unit will be too high. I said this also last year in St. Pete, even in an interview, and till today I didn't receive a call from the Kremlin, so <laughs> I'm very comfortable to saying this. And we start to look and audit several partners. And for us, the best partners have been two Russian companies. One is Pharma Standard, uh, a leader in uh, biotechnology, and they produce uh, all our high-tech products linked to the biotechnology. Uh, and Nanolec, who produce our classic medicines. And uh, of course, to find a partner is not easy, because you need to go to several audits. Uh, you need to uh, even transfer technology, which is not cheap. Uh, it's also a huge investment. And uh, you need also to be much more closer on this transfer of technology and training and so on. And this we are doing. Uh, three weeks ago, Manolek inaugurated a new production line which was built only for Merck. So we can see that uh, we found our, our partners and uh, it was not difficult. Great, thank you. A great story of success. Uh, the next question uh, goes to you, Johan, and I wanted to ask you to think of um, uh, success story of the last, uh, say, five years, what, which you can mention, a success story of your company in Russia, something outstanding, what has happened? Uh, well, I think uh, the good thing is uh, that um, Schneider, uh, we have been ahead of the curve in understanding uh, the importance of localization. Uh, while uh, many customers, uh, sorry, competitors, competitors were still looking at the Russian market as a market uh, where to export to, um, already um, even before all the geopolitical problems and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the pressure on the imports of machine, we really understood that uh, if you want to be successful in the country itself, you have to be present here. Uh, which basically meant that we have invested more than a billion euro over the last uh, years in uh, setting up uh, local manufacturing and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, either through acquisitions or from greenfield operations, so it depends uh, where it makes most sense. Um, and we will continue that, uh, that road. Um, but at the same time, um, it also has to make business sense. Uh, often we are being asked by the authorities to almost localize the entire portfolio of what we are selling. Yeah? That also economically is not justified uh, because you need to have minimum volumes as well to, uh, to be competitive on the market. And another challenge, uh, back to your point about uh, regulation, which, uh, which uh, uh, could, uh, could be harmful, um, um, today no longer in place, but at a moment in time, um, there was this first concept of a SPIC, Special Investment Contract, uh, which as such is an honorable thing to do. 
but when we were uh, looking at the, at the legal requirements um, uh, to, uh, to sign a speak, it said that uh, in three years' time, uh, more than 80% of the complex Jewish, uh, of the of the infit that you that you use for your local manufacturer also had to come from other domestic companies. Now, um, I remember, and I think it's a good example which highlights the, the challenges. Um, uh, I remember that we were uh, at that moment looking in localization of the last generation of circuit breakers, uh, which today we are, for instance, producing in Grenoble in France. We wanted to do that uh, under a uh, SPIC uh, contract. Uh, the authority said, yes, okay, uh, do that. 90% of um, the materials have to come from other Russian entities. We did an audit in Grenoble, in our French factory. What is the French content in our French factory? Turns out that the French content in our French factory was about 30%. You talk about components which we procure on the global market in, in Taiwan, in, in Europe, in the States, and you name it. So if you then go back and you say, yes, we would like to uh, uh, localize it, uh, yes, we do a big effort to use as much as possible other competitive um, Russian infeed, but we will not make uh, any compromise on, on quality. Uh, we will not make any compromise on price. So that's the kind of a thing that the dialogue that we are having, and by the way, also the AEB, uh, uh, we are doing that towards the authorities, and I find that very receptive, um, stimulate uh, local production, absolutely a good thing to do, supportive of imports of machinery, absolutely a good thing to do, but let's do it in a clever way, let's do it in a roadmap, and never forget that we are living in a global economy. Thank you, Johan. Antonio, I wanted to have your comment on, you have, you have mentioned you have several factories, eighth, you're building the eighth one uh, in Russia, uh, spread around the country. Uh, which is your assessment of uh, the labor availability and productivity nowadays? We all know about the demographic situation in Russia. It is tough. It is hard uh, often to find people. Uh, which is the difference which you see in between the capitals and the regions? You should have see, uh, seen a lot. And uh, which ways out of the situation you find when you cannot find the people? Yeah, this is a, a very good question, uh, as all of them have been. But th this one, actually, I believe, is one one of the of the um, difficulties to overcome as well. We have, and it is a privilege, and I think that Russia, in this regard, uh, has a, a very good uh, situation with a, an unemployment rate that is well known to everyone and that is uh, significantly low when compared to many other countries. Uh, what happens is that this very low unemployment rate make is, makes it very difficult to really um, be in this permanent search for efficiency that uh, all my colleagues have been uh, mentioning as one of the key issues for reaching uh, uh, profitability in the business and for being able then to export and for being able to to uh, require the, the levels of, of, of uh, uh, efficiency that are necessary to be competitive. What we see is that there is little mobility, very little mobility between different regions. There are regions when there is, where there is people available, there are regions where people are not available, and there is no transfer of people. And this comes from, uh, we have an uh, analyzed uh, through the years, and we see two uh, reasons f for that. First reason is that during the privatization, many people got their apartments in ownership, and there is a very strong culture of ownership of the place where you live in Russia, compared to many other countries where people live for rent and are much more uh, ready to move and to go in search for uh, business opportunities. In Russia, there is a strong uh, link to the place where you have your apartment in ownership, and this is uh, even uh, strengthened by the fact that when you move to any other region, then a big share of your salary in that other region, if not all your salary would go to pay uh, the rental because there is little offer of residential with good quality and with affordable prices. That would be one of the reasons, and this is one reason that is manageable and that can be managed by, uh, I believe, governments by developing <coughs> policies that could compensate this difficulty. The second main reason, I believe, is more of a psychological one. Historically, and coming from the Soviet times, in Russia, moving from one place to the other was requiring a lot of uh, paperwork, including registration in the place where you come. That was mandatory and not something that you could choose whether to do or not. And this still remains in, in therefore, the, the level of excitement that any 
employable person requires to move from one region to the other is higher than in any other place in Europe. What happens that the only place that meets this level of excitement is Moscow. And what happens is that Moscow generates an excess of attraction that therefore makes less attractive other regions. So my point is we need to, uh, Moscow is great and is growing and is growing well and, and healthy, but it cannot be at the expense of not having a well-balanced uh, structure all around the country. Uh, this is something that needs to be worked. Otherwise, not, it's not possible to produce in Moscow, that is clear. And if we need to produce in other regions, we need as well qualified and smart and, import and good people in, in regions. And last comment, very quick comment. I love and we love uh, Kalushka Oblast where we are, we love Len Oblast, but we need to understand that sometimes it's not necessary to be where everyone else is. Sometimes it's necessary to be there where you will be the one that will benefit from the local labor market. Thank you for saying that, because I'm always advising when people are asking, I mean, new companies are asking about advice on HR, uh, availability uh, of uh, human resources in the regions. I'm always saying you, you have to, it should be the first issue, the people, if you have the, the employees over there where you are planning to go, not only uh, important financial aspects. Thank you. So no, now coming to uh, surprise, surprise. Um, let's start with um, Albert. You have mentioned that uh, from the times uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, you have been uh, the partner of um, Gazprom, and you are uh, happy with with this partnering and lucky enough. And your company is also involved in the projects uh, North Stream One and Two which we hear a lot about. Uh, the questions are, are you satisfied with North Stream 1? Uh, what is your assessment for the moment of North Stream 2? Any suggestions when it may really start? Uh, and uh, another part, and I, I have not mentioned actually, I'm sorry to interrupt myself, but I have formulated the questions, all of the questions, uh, there will be several, so that you could choose which one to answer, just in case you do not want to, I'm sorry. Uh, you may answer some of these questions and skip the others. Uh, I hope the audience will not uh, realize that you are doing that. Uh, so why Angie and other European partners um, has decided well, prefer actually to build uh, a new pipeline, to support building a new pipeline, and do not modernize the Ukrainian uh, gas transit system. So, honestly, I didn't really think we will be into a discussion like that because th the question is very much politicized. Of that. Good Good perspectives. Yeah, okay. With your permission, if you would give me two minutes of time, I would like to go back to your previous questions on HR, on human resources, on how to select people, and I have a good case on how it can be linked to the digitalization. I have a case on how it's going on. So recently my daughter was to a job interview, but uh, by, with a computer, she logged on to Skype, um, a video was started, and she was answering a question uh, to a computer. So this is the way how one of a major U.S. Uh, bank uh, shortlists their potential interns. Yes, personally to me it was very funny to watch my daughter doing this interview in Paris. But on the other hand, I was concerned because it's not possible to understand how she's likely to answer. People may be in I have some phobias. It's uh, very challenging psychologically to stand in front of a computer or a camera, but uh, that doesn't mean 
uh, uh, she she lacks any knowledge. So digitalization is very helpful. We are living in a global world, but human factor and human contacts are really important, are fundamental, and that's the only way of uh, how you can understand uh, who you are dealing with that, and the human factor will still have a decisive role. Um, do you believe HR is required? It's a must. Uh, yes, I believe that anyway, well, we have a lot of young people here uh, watching us and thinking how they managed to achieve, but the human mm, factor is absolutely important. You must have professional skills, but you must know how to communicate with people, dialogue and partnership. Uh, they all depend on human relations. So, and uh, this is just a hint for you. But going back to your question, we are very happy with our partnership in Nord Stream 1. Uh, this uh, project is running well. We have no complaints. And there is nothing specific to comment on. But as for Nord Stream 2, I would like to mention two things. So uh, the project uh, is quite often discussed by people who are not really aware about the core of the project and they allow themselves to comment and uh, the comments um, roll like a snowball and we have like a Santa Claus uh, out of it. But what we really need, people that read news on these topics, they might ask themselves so who writes and why and what's hidden behind the lines. Secondly, we have some objective, objective questions we need to review. At the moment, you need some extra volumes of hydrocarbons, and all buyers keep saying that. So we are telling about uh, the European Union of 27-28, uh, the consumption keeps growing and the domestic production keeps uh, dropping and according to our calculations by 2030 volumes uh, shortage of volumes is likely to grow so physically the shortage of gas volumes is in place so from the very beginning this need uh, indicates that our companies uh, contacted Gazprom. It's our intrinsic partner. It's geographically too close. So they have gas, we have our uh, demand for the gas, and it's normal for us to discuss being involved into the project. And as for uh, the uh, LPG, we can uh, bring it from the US uh, and uh, sell in Europe as for LNG. Of course, it's good for competitiveness of the market. No one uh, objects to that. We are happy about this phenomenon. We can have American LNG or any other sources are fine for us because this will make uh, our European companies to be competitive. This develops the market. The market. And uh, that would be great if not only Gazprom in Russia can export gas, but some uh, new independent producers emerge. This will improve uh, the relations and the overall atmosphere in the oil and gas sector. There is a number of important parameters that should be taken into account with regards to this project. But as for the sanctions, they existed. Uh, early on, uh, when there was an idea about the uh, transfer through Ukraine, there were sanctions, and we uh, cannot do anything about that. There will always be uh, people unhappy about such situation. Right now, we continue lobbying that, and we will uh, be persistent about this project if uh, something um, Emergen uh, some emergency bursts out and we'll take uh, critical measures. 
This is good for the competitiveness, but the only thing we don't like is when we are dictated what to do, what to buy, and at what price. Uh, a buyer should be able to decide by itself, and this is better for the seller when the seller can uh, sell uh, to can work with many different clients. That's my answer. Uh, a few years ago, Schneider uh, Electric has bought 100% of shares of a Russian company located in Samara, Electroshield, a major Russian producer of uh, electrical equipment. I wanted to ask you uh, how would you comment on the deal, uh, which was your which is your assessment of this experience, and did you get any support from the Russian authorities at federal or local level or both, whatever you would like to share? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, no, yeah. <laughs> Diet Maros. <laughs> you can speak about the labor as well. Yes, <laughs> sure. No, I it's think, easier for um, me anyway. It has been a very, very important uh, milestone for uh, for the company. It was a major, uh, major investment that we had indeed made. Uh, a company uh, with uh, uh, more than six thousand uh, employees, um, which indeed has helped us substantially in increasing our footprint uh, uh, on uh, on the market because we used to uh, import that type of equipment from abroad. So we became much more. Uh, uh, price competitive, uh, we took uh, definitely a, a market share. And I think indeed um, the fact that it was based uh, uh, not in Moscow but in the region uh, was also a good, uh, good thing. Um, uh, yes, you have uh, uh, very qualified uh, employees in, in Samara, which is a beautiful uh, city. Um, initially, we, by the way, um, sent uh, a number of uh, um, expatriates uh, to, to Samara as well uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the business processes which uh, after the acquisition were uh, introduced were exactly the same as we have in our other factories worldwide. But in the meantime, uh, we have phased out uh, most of those uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign experts, uh, relying absolutely on the, on the, on the, the local force. And uh, uh, being in the region um, um, and being close to the regional administration was also a very good thing. Um, if you <coughs> are an investor and you make... Um, the investment in, 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 in Moscow itself, and you have a issue. Uh, if you want to go to the authorities, you will be one of the thousands which are knocking on the door. Um, if you're making a strategic investment in the regions, we do find, and that is the same for other places where we have made an investment, that the regional authorities, they do a lot really to help uh, you feel comfortable if you have a hurdle uh, with uh, access to gas, electricity, or a regulatory one. Uh, they are very, very proactive and, and helpful. So. Uh, I think the combination of uh, um, uh, a local footprint, um, good staff, um, uh, and support from uh, from uh, from the authorities have led uh, to the to the success story that we have. Now working. Thank you. Uh, you want it, Antonio. The next will be yours. Uh, your business area is uh, part of construction area. Uh, it is well known that uh, this sector in Russia, at least in Russia, faces serious uh, issues of corruption. Uh, is it Russian specifics or is it usual for this business sector in, I don't know, in European countries or in other countries of the world, if you can compare? Uh, do you face such problems and how do you deal with them? If you do, which steps would you recommend to the Russian government uh, to, in order to uh, reduce uh, corruption in this field? And the skip away question is, uh, which of the, re it's not connected, uh, which of the regions uh, which you have, where you have production, if you want to, uh, to answer it, you may skip or whatever you wish. Uh, which of the regions where you have production sites you would name as the most attractive for uh, business and why from your, your standpoint? Okay, now, now is where I should speak about the weather because labor I already spoke. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me, let me uh, with regards to the first question, the, the, 
the corruption. Yeah, corruption uh, is something that exists everywhere. There is no no uh, human being that that is more uh, inclined towards corruption. It's not about human beings. It's about it's about the systems, the systems that are in place to allow for the corruption to happen or not. That's called the motivation systems, and that's something that applies to companies, to processes, to to anything that you set up. If you do not set it up strong uh, and robust enough, corruption may happen because there are different people with different understandings of what is fair and of their degree of participation in this fair distribution. Uh, therefore, with this I answer to the first question, there is corruption in Russia? Certainly there is. Uh, there, is no, there is more corruption in Russia than in other places? Yes, Chistichna. Uh, why? Because uh, systems are less robust. S many of the systems for uh, managing and, uh, and uh, dealing with all the processes of taking decisions are uh, still not strong enough, robust enough. Uh, uh, what is our contact with corruption? Well, thanks God, uh, none at all, because we do not uh, at all participate, except knowing that it happens. We know that it happens, and we know uh, that uh, sometimes partners of us that are buying wholesale uh, and are participating in tenders, well, sometimes, but it is happening, and I have to say, and this is true, this is not the advertisement, in these 15, 16 years, it's happening less and less. That's a fact, and, and we see it everywhere and we see it from our partners, the possibilities of them to influence the processes. And this is logical because all these business processes are becoming more and more robust because all the business owners are interested in the uh, businesses to work more transparently and the uh, distribution of the profit to work more efficiently and more transparently. And uh, this is a joint effort, w basically, if to advise how to continue into that. Uh, well, business will bring that naturally if, bring, if business can develop naturally. With this, I leave the first question. I hope I, I, I escaped it reasonably well. And then the second question uh, is a question that is uh, th that I have partially answered uh, already. We are very satisfied in every region where we are, and every region where we are has different <coughs> has different um, uh, degrees and, and specifics of what makes them more or less attractive. In the end, it is a matter of analyzing your business model and understanding, do you need to be closer to Moscow? Is that your bigger or exclusive market? Is it not? So there are too many reasons uh, as to be able to give a, a, a single answer to that. But I gave one overall answer before that does not refer to any of the regions where we are, but refers in general to the attitude to business. Do not uh, restrict yourself artificially. Russia is big, and uh, the fact that there are no other multinational companies there, it doesn't mean that there cannot be other multinational uh, companies there. Now, in some regions, we are fighting for labor in ways that are not allowing us to bring the efficiency that is necessary for, for, for profitability of the business. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Antonio. Jürgen, next is yours. Uh, health sector is always under, uh, I would say, close attention of the uh, government, of the state. Uh, how do you find your interaction with the Ministry of Health, of, uh, in Russia, I mean? And can you give any advice uh, to the Minister how to encourage uh, the local production of uh, drugs, medicals, uh, by uh, major foreign companies here? A very tricky question. Uh, I believe uh, the issue of healthcare is the issue of each government. It doesn't matter if in uh, uh, North, South America, in Asia, Europe, or Africa, and as well here in Russia. I think uh, it's the role of the government to assure the accessibility to the medicine. And there are, of course, medicines, and you know it, uh, which I call is the high tech, the later generation, mostly, for example, in the area of multiple sclerosis or cancer, uh, and they are extremely expensive. And so the citizen by himself will not be able to buy it. It's not because the industry wants to make a lot of profit, but uh, we need to understand that uh, the research period of <coughs> a new drug is between 10 to 15 years 
and on the end, when the drug is going to the market, uh, they have only few years with the patent protection. So this is why the, uh, the medicine becomes very, uh, very high. Uh, what we at Merck are doing uh, regarding medicines or regulations and so on, we interact with the government, uh, we explain them exactly what we're doing, how we are doing it, why the drug is important, and what kind of benefits this drug can bring for the country. Sometimes by taking, and I take now a very simple and, uh, example, uh, we launched uh, last year, 2018, in the month of September or October, together with the government, the uh, Ministry of Health, the Pre-Diabetes Day. We all know there is a Diabetes Day, but Pre-Diabetes Day is something new. <coughs> Why? Because if we can identify a patient with pre-diabetes, and if this patient will take a simple medicine on a regular basis, and I'm talking about a not expensive drug, it will be a void somewhere in the future that he will need to cut the leg or go even to hospitalization. This means for the government it will be much, much cheaper than by not doing it. So this is always the, what we call the pharma economics. So when we are interacting with the government, we are always showing the pharma economics, the cost benefits of a treatment. And uh, in the past, there have been companies uh, launching drugs in the area of cancer where you could uh, prolong the life for six months and 12 months and so on. And sometimes even for four months. And uh, I remember that I had uh, even interaction with patients, with professors, with doctors. And what is the value of the four months for a patient? Uh, this is individual decision. But for the government, they want to see, of course, some, a patient to be cured, a patient to have a huge prolongation of the life. Again, what we're doing is we are interacting with ministries. We are in, I'm talking ministries because it's not only the health ministries. And I would like here that the ministries in between would interact much more. This is uh, really one of my wishes. Uh, that uh, we do not need to go to several and then ask him, but please call to your colleague, talk to them, share, exchange opinions, and so on. Uh, and we also uh, work together with, and we are part of an expert group at the Duma on the healthcare uh, committee. We have been invited to be part there, uh, where we can also share our experience and uh, uh, share and give sometimes also recommendations. Thank you very much, Jürgen. <clears throat> Cesare, your turn. I'm scaring. Huh? <laughs> ah, <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, you also have an escape way. Uh, you work for an Italian company, and your government uh, has mentioned many times that uh, they would support national companies uh, who are ready to work and develop in Russia. Have you seen any real application of these uh, words? Uh, I mean, on your own experience or experience of other Italian companies here in Russia, possibly of your friends. Uh, and uh, the escape way is your brownfield in Rybinsk. How is it working in Rybinsk? And uh, if looking back, uh, was the brownfield uh, a correct decision uh, well, many do uh, green fields, and so many say that it's easier. Uh, so that's the escape way, if you wish. Okay, I prefer to speak, to continue discussing about Italian food, as we did before. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we go ahead and try to answer. Yes, we are one of the example of the support that wow. Italian is doing. I never knew it. No, come on. Uh, Honestly to say, uh, Italy, from a political point of view, independently from the, the, the government we have, because we change uh, at least uh, three or four governments in the last uh, 
not here, but a few years ago, all uh, say that uh, sanction is, was not a solution. I think it's a very strong political support that the Italian government did uh, toward uh, the support of Russia. That's my opinion. Eh? I will not <laughs> bring in any <laughs> political opinion on behalf of Italy. For sure, it's my personal opinion. And this is a very strong sign. That's my answer about your first question. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a strong one. Uh, second, Rybinsk. If you like fishing, Rybinsk is fantastic. And <laughs> everybody knows this. The name itself says this. Uh, when, I, when I arrived in Rybinsk, uh, First time uh, to scout uh, a small company to acquire, I was uh, surprised by the motivation of the people to have a multinational company there. And uh, this is something that didn't change. And this is, in my opinion, the engine and the gasoline that we have today in our, in our company. I tell you that when I arrive, I say to the people, uh, uh, guys, uh, there was nobody speaking uh, English there. And I say, in a few years, I will do the New Year speech in Russia, but none, nobody of you will uh, be authorized to, uh, to speak Russian. And then uh, you say, I did the speech after four years, okay, in a very bad Russian, as it is now, by the way. Uh, and uh, let me say 90% of the people uh, were speaking English. So they were motivated. I'm not, I'm not speaking only about young people. That's a type of uh, gasoline and motivation we had. And on top of that, uh, we had a lot of training. Uh, the people were keen in understanding the, the, the process and so on. So, uh, I'm answering also to your question. Yes, it was the right decision at the end. Even if the, the amount of uh, people living there was not so big, so the risk not to find uh, labor and the profession was high, but, uh, you know, motivation uh, compensated this a lot. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, we still have several minutes. Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Can I add something? Yes, you can. We were talking about the image. This is a very important thing. As I've mentioned in the very beginning, I've been living for many years in France and I can see um, what the image of Russia is in the eyes of the French people. When I come to Russia, uh, Russians want to cooperate, but the Russian government has a very big task. Uh, they need to improve the image of Russia in the eyes of Europeans. What, how can that be achieved? That's a very challenging uh, thing. We see that a lot of people do not know a lot about Russia, but they are biased and they have very negative attitude. That's something which is very important. Please understand it well. Russia has great potential for working with Europe, with France, but we need to make sure that uh, Europe uh, sees Russia uh, favorably. Uh, take one or two questions from the audience, if uh, if there are any. Uh, any any mic provided or not? I can speak up. Okay, I'm sorry. I I uh, uh, we have it. We still have it. Um, okay, so I work in business and human rights and sustainability, and I've been so curious about what this looks like in the Russian market because I worked closer with the US and Europe, and I've only been here a year or two. 
Um, so my question to you is whether you are making investments in sustainability, especially environmental sustainability, but all the aspects of business and human rights, and what specifically that looks like in Russia, in the Russian market, whether you're facing resistance or support. Um, I'm just, it's a broad question because I'm curious about everything going on that front. Thank to you. To whom is the question, I'm sorry. Um, to anybody who feels there. A volunteer, who is yeah. the volunteer? Let me go you. to this. <laughs> Even by not having their own production site, by looking to our partners, we, this was one of the criteria which was very important for us. So in most partners, they have this kind of mindset. They are working in this direction. I'm not saying that they are perfectly in this, but they are working and in line with our company culture and values. When we built our uh, life science lab at Metropolis, this was also a major issue for me and I went there several times. I had several meetings with the managing director because I found a couple of things there which I didn't like and they changed also. Uh, by the way, we are even uh, neighbors of Schneider at Metropolis. Uh, we are on the same floor there. And um, in the office, uh, even being Brazilian, I spent a couple of years in Germany and I was in German educated for the separation paper, glass and plastics and so on. And I became addict of this now. And so for me it's always painful when in the garbage we are mixing everything and nothing will be utilized. And in the company I said, look, uh, there is so much paper and uh, in the shredder and so on, so on. And then we spoke to the landlord and we create in our building, in, for all the uh, intentants, uh, the separation. Starting with simple batteries which you can bring from your home and put there, uh, and paper and, and so on, so on. It was nice to see how it's easy to educate people, because our employees need to be, first of all, educated. So I was the only blind could go there and separate the things. But the others need to be correct. And say, it's not here, it's there. So we had the, 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 the posters there and so on. But it's a point of education. And I think there is a lot to be done here. And if I see only the garbage collection in Moscow, it's so painful. I'm always happy when I see someone collecting uh, glasses to sell it later on, and, uh, because this is a start. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, we cannot, I'm sorry, the organizers uh, have advised we cannot take any more questions. You wanted to add just briefly. Yes, very quick. Uh, we have seven factories and we have seen the, the progress of, of uh, of it, uh, of course, well, first of all, as uh, Cesare was saying, as well as Johan was saying, everyone who has production here and to be able to confront all these uh, changes in the business environment, you need to export and to export to Europe. And you, need, you know perfectly that they, that means that you require all the certifications in this regard. That's first thing. Second thing, we are supplying to IKEA, to Leroy Merlin, to many that belong to international operators and have strong requirements and, and run audits in your factories every year to see that you meet every requirement. And thirdly, the Russian government has been incorporating new regulations uh, every year and uh, making uh, this not only something that the company will be doing on their own assessment of the importance of sustainability, but something uh, that is a, a requirement of the Russian legislation as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, I would like to wrap up. I have uh, done my best to structure a phrase out of your uh, words, which you have mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, it is, uh, I made it like this, positive challenging opportunities under the con context of continuity and stability. So business is great, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>